The American company Abyss is a manufacturer of open back planar headphones. We have reviewed a couple of their units on the channel, the Diana V2 and the Diana Phi. Both were out of the ordinary because they were knocked stock. The Diana V2 that we got for review, which was a personal unit of mine, had been modded by another YouTuber, DMS, in regards to the pads and the headband. The Diana 5, which was sent to us via viewer, Jez, thank you very much, which was tailored in regards to its coloration to the user's desires, basically. This is their flagship line, the Abyss AB1266 Phi. The latest edition of this unit is the Abyss AB1266 Phi TC. There have been a myriad of driver updates over the last decade. And this is a combination of a lot of things. A bit of a unicorn, something you can't buy. Yet, ultra intriguing and still very useful. Let's discuss. Before we dive into this wooden sarcophagus, uh, I would like to clear up a few caveats. The original AB1266 came out in 2013, or thereabouts, and there was a driver edition update in around 2015, or thereabouts. And then there was another one after that around 2018, the AB1266, the Phi, and the TC. This unit is a bit of a strange one. It's the chassis of the AB1266 original from 2013. Yet the driver is the Abyss AB1266 Phi. It's quite unique, so let's dive in and see what we get. Unfortunately, you will not be able to buy this one. You will be able to buy the TC or the Phi variant. Thank you. Literally have to assemble this headphone yourself. We get some accessories. Then we have the beast itself. That was a mission. So, first and foremost, let's actually build the headphones themselves. We get a pair of pads that are magnetically attachable to the cups themselves, like so. It's so strong, you have to be really careful as well, actually. Uh, and this one on this side, so it covers the driver and protects it at least. Oh, nice click though. Well done, Abyss. Love it. Uh, this is the pad itself. So if we find out which direction this headphone goes in, and it will be like this, I promise you there is a method to the madness here. You will hook the leather like that over the little hooks that we have on the sides to create the headband for the headphones themselves. Like that, we have the suspension strap. Obviously it has to be hooked from underneath so that as it goes up, it cinches and secures itself. That's it. The headphones are built and we're gonna put that over there. And we're going to have a look at some of the cables and stuff we get. So we first of all get, this is a third party braided cable. It's four pin XLR, cloth covered and they start with mini XLRs for the headphones but you will not be able to use your ZMF or even uh, Odyssey uh, mini XLR cables because these are pinned slightly differently and they won't actually fit. So I'm gonna throw that over there seeing as there's third party. This is the cable that comes with the Abyss headphones. There are a myriad of variations you can get and this one the previous user had obviously selected a three pin XLR left and right for some reason. Some amps actually have that, but it's very rare. This is an adapter to go from three pin XLR, stereo obviously a pair, into four pin XLR for our regular amplifiers. And we have another one, same principle, three pin XLR female obviously to a 6.3 single ended jack. That's for your tube, that's gonna come back later. And this is obviously the mini XLR to three pin XLR left and right, but I've had to braid it like so. It doesn't normally come like this, normally separated one per side, uh, just for ergonomic sake, because that was a freaking nightmare. I wasn't dealing with that, not around a studio. 
So this is the flagship Abyss AB1266 Phi. Their latest uh, variant is the TC model, obviously, and it's slightly tuned differently. This sounds more different even than the Diana Phi. Even more different than the actual original AB1266 Phi that came out in 2015. It's a bit of a bizarre one, um, but we will discuss that in the sound section. This frame I think has been run over by a Jeep. It's that freaking strong. It's just one piece. You can't move the cups. You can't do anything until you start manipulating it. But we'll get onto that in a moment. So it's very, very strong. This is a planar headphone uh, at 47 ohms. It's 88 dB sensitivity. So it's quite hard to drive and it's ultra, ultra source picky. It will sound different on everything you put it on completely open back and the frequency response of this is 5 hertz all the way up to 30 kilohertz so a very wide bandwidth okay let's talk about some of the functionalities of this frame the headband adjusts up and down like this and depending on the size of your head it will either be stretched up here so that the headband is almost touching the steel band up top or it'll be down here for me it's somewhere in the middle uh, it's elasticated it's very strong and it's very wide and comfortable. In fact, this headphone is very heavy, but due to its ergonomics, it's far more comfortable than you possibly think it possibly could be. I'm going to discuss the pads first. Like I stated, these are magnetic. They just clip on. But where you can see this stitching, where the leather has been stitched together, that's basically the marker point for your uh, adjustments. So the pads can actually click onto the cups like this. And again, like this. So as you can see, the stitching was up here. Now it's there. There are eight clicks per side, I believe. You can adjust the pad depending on how you want it to sound in different variations of where that line is. And there's about eight clicks or so, it might be even more actually. For me personally, it sounds absolutely its best here, like so. So the line is there and then we're gonna have to match that with this other side going like this here. So they are aligned. Well, no, they're not aligned. Let's try here. One more, yoink. And the magnet is so strong, you really have to be very, very careful so that it's not touching the driver or anything. There we go, perfect. Now, not only can you say, change the sound characteristics via the pad rotation, but here is its other party trick. You pull the headband like this, increasing the width like this or like this. So the closer the drivers are to your ears or the wider it is, the more different the sound becomes. I will tell you actually how that affects um, sound characteristics in the sound section. Also, you can tow in the headphones like so, and you can also tow the headphones out like so, which again changes the sound characteristics. This headphone is intriguing. I've been waiting to get my hands on it for a very, very long time. And now it's here. It's been here for about three months. Um, I've had a great deal of fun with it and it, in fact it's become my daily driver. It's the perfect companion for the headphones back there, the hi fi and Sazvaras. It's very interesting. Complete polar opposites. So with that, let's discuss the sound. First and foremost, before I start discussing the sound, I'm going to discuss what happens when you pull the headphone headband out and in and toe out and toe in, because every aspect of that changes. And not only that, I will discuss the pad rotation in regard to sound effects too. In fact, actually, let's discuss the sound characteristics of the headphones themselves so it gives you a nice baseline to start from. These headphones are V-shaped. 
but they're not V-shaped in such a way that it affects the mid-range. That's what's remarkable about the drivers. It's V-shaped in its tonality. And yet, the mid-range is as clear as crystal as the base region. It's kind of odd. It's got the same tonality from the sub-bass all the way up to the treble region. Ultra high resolution. Very, very, very intense detail. And the most visceral bass you have ever come across on a headphone. It does not sound like traditional headphones in the slightest. For every element of Hi-Fi Mensa's Vara being controlled, being neutral, being realistic, the AB1266 takes that and enhances it in a fun way. These are one of the most fun headphones money can buy including the TC, which I will discuss in regards to comparisons later on. But for now, we're just taking this one. Stage, depending on how you have the fit, can be closed. So just sounding okay, like the equivalent of Atrium or VC, to sounding like one of the most open, enormous sounding HD 800S-like experiences money can buy depending on equipment. This unit can be delicate in the treble region with hyper detail and spicy in regards to tonal delivery but yet still be smooth. It's got a weird characteristic where it's not overly energetic in regards to peaks but it is forward in the treble region and it is hyper detailed, hyper high resolution and so addictive for acoustic guitars, plucky instruments, the upper ends of violins or the elements of an electronic track, for example, Monster Cat or Infected Mushroom or the hyper detail retrieval of a band like Polythea, Liquid Tension Experiment Lamb of God, or animals as leaders. Dropping down to the mid-range, we discussed that this is a V-shaped headphone, so the mid-range is pushed back. But unlike other headphones, where one other IEM had this incredible characteristics, that being the IER Z1R from Sony, None of the elements of the mid-range is lost. It's just pushed back. It's not in your face, giving you the open feeling the stage requires for that soundscape. Usually, with V-shaped headphones, the lower mid-range tends to get overly lost in the upper bass region and within the convolution of the track delivery, not the 1266 Phi. It will highlight every element of electric guitars, vocals, male and female. Any instruments that resides in this category texturally without being lost and yet it just pushed back. So that it's in front of you in the arena rather than in your face. Dropping down to the bass region. The Abyss AB1266 Phi is one of the most visceral, fun, subwoofer-esque bass regions you will find on any headphones, period. It's one of the most addictive bass responses for electronic music I've honestly ever come across. And I have hi fi Varas on Monoblock AHP2, on the HM1, on the Bliss. This takes the biscuit. But everything I have described comes back to how you manipulate the headphone and what source equipment you place the Abyss AB1266 Phi on. It's ultra important. So with that summary of the sound characteristics, let's discuss the sources that have been used here at CMA.
as I stated, this headphone has been here for a few months and in that time we've had a lot of equipment come in. We have had the HM1 headphone amplifier from Tseil, the German manufacturer that creates professional equipment for studios, the Holo Audio Bliss back there, the CMA15, the Cord TT2 and also for DACs I have used the Holo Audio Make ATE, my own, the Cord TT2, thank you Mo, I appreciate it very much and also a myriad of other DACs that have come through the channel for review such as the CMA15, such as the Hugo 2, etc. Oh, and the Luxury and Precision P6 Pro. Reviews for all of those things, if not being released yet, are on the way. And for tubes, we have had the KNHA6A, the KNHA300 Mark II, well, LROG tubes, the Euphoria over there, that's an OTL amp, so you've got to be kind of careful with planars and uh, low impedance headphones on that thing, but it touts that it can do 32 ohm. This is 47, so we tried it and it was fine. We will discuss that in the sound section in regards to tubes. So, a myriad of equipment, very high end equipment, the sort of equipment that the 1266 requires. I'm sorry, you will not be able to get the kind of performance we've been getting here on a Topping A90 and a uh, D1SE, so or something similar like that. This is a super flagship headphone in the 6500 category and you're going to need equipment to back that up in every way. First and foremost, this headphone sings on tubes. It's designed for tubes. It sounds its best on tubes and I will discuss that first. On the KNHA300 Mark IIs, with the LROG tubes providing not only liquid transparency, but a touch of tube warmth, organic nature, holographic imaging, and massive spatial presentation, the Abyss AB1266 Phi goes from a soundstage this big, for example, to way out here to this deep to way beyond over there. It takes the soundstage from a private setting, just even having it closed in like this, to an arena-like experience where you can feel in your mind's eye, you can literally not walk around each element, you can sprint around each element. It's one of the most vast, visceral, impactful, fun sounding headphones money can buy. For electronic music, for fast paced music, for punchy music, it's heaven. And on tubes, where I stated this headphone's a V-shaped headphone, that mid-range is given life, lushness, organic, and comes forward a little bit too, and warms up, and therefore bringing the frequency response more in line with a flat linear line. Not too much, because the innate characteristics of these headphones is V-shaped, obviously, but it tames the treble region down quite a bit on tubes. You get the hyper detail still and everything, but you get a lot more focus on the mid-range. And as a mid-range freak, me, this has been a tube daily driver for me. It's been absolutely freaking outstanding. Detail retrieval, transparency is off the charts. I will do some comparisons with Sasvara later on. Okay, so what happens when you manipulate the headphones? You can't just pull this out like this and get the biggest sound stage. You can't just tow it out and open the stage out and you can't just tow it in to bring it close. But that's the general gist. If you open the headphones too much, the bass can go out of whack and you can immediately tell it doesn't sound right. It sounds overly bloated. But there is a subtle manipulation that has to be done depending on the shape of your head. Where for example, you pull it out a tiny bit like that a tiny bit more, a tiny bit more during your testing. This is a two day learning curve. For the first two days, if you're OCD, you're going to go mad. If you're not, 
you will find the right spot. And now for me, it just takes me literally 30 seconds to find the best fit for myself, where it's a tiny bit of a gap like this, toe out a little bit like that, and the pads, like I stated, the rotation is right here for me. That's perfect. Another trick of these headphones is, unlike other headphones, you will have to unlearn what you have heard. Perfect seal for IEMs. Perfect seal for headphones. It's important, it's crucial, don't wear sunglasses. The pads have to seal perfectly. With the Abyss AB1266 Phi Anti-C, this turns this on its head. You have to break the seal. Headphone pads should not be sealed around your ears. If it is, you're not going to get the stage, imaging, or what I've been talking about for the last 10 minutes. No, you will have to forgo that little voice in your head going, the pads have to seal. No, the pads have to be open. And when they're open, whether you break the seal in the front, up here, down here, behind your ears, or above up here, depending on your head shape, because this is very conducive to the shape of your head and genetics. For me, the break is here by my eyes, this little bit here. That's why the thinnest part of the pad is up here near my temples. I get the most incredible visceral bass response that these headphones can deliver. Yet it's sealed all the way around the ears, head from behind, and it's just broken in the front. But when you break that seal, not only does stage widen, but the bass goes down to your balls. It goes balls deep, literally. It's one of the most fun sounded headphones. It's the yin to the yang of the hi fi Vara. That's why they're both on my desk. That's why they are companions of each other, genuinely. I think you will understand a lot more when I do the let me paint you a picture scene. Also, there is another trick, as I stated, if you toe out the headphones like I've been doing now and like I do for myself, some people have it flat, which you really shouldn't. I mean, depending on your head shape, but still, even then, toeing it out, literally opens the stage like this. The way I can describe it to you, it's a bit like chords cross feed, where everything seems to be tilting the drivers that way and just opening the stage in front of you and throwing all the sound in front of you. It's genuinely fantastic. For classical, for gaming, for movies, I tow out. For focused, narrow stage tracks that have been mixed that way in the studio, I go back to flat and then toe in a millimeter like this for my head shape. And still, having the pads here still is comfortable for me. But for some people, having to toe out or toe in, they would need to manipulate the pads and rotate it like this, for example, and obviously like this. This will change the sound characteristics, obviously, because you're breaking the seal somewhere else. So like I stated, it's a complicated headphone to get right, but once you have had it for a few months, even within the first week, to be honest with you, after stop experimenting, you will find that you know exactly where to place this, as I'm demonstrating here, badly. There we go. Nah, I didn't do it. See what I mean? You can't do this on your ears. You literally have to go like, bloop. It won't do it. Okay, here, like that. So you will have a great deal of fun with these headphones, manipulating it and getting a few different variations. And by the way, every variation you create for yourself, whether it's toe out or toe in or closed or wide, you will create four separate headphones for yourself, depending on your scenario. They are ultra versatile. And coming back to the sound characteristics now on solid state. Um, it depends on what uh, solid state amp you're using. For example, on the HM1, driver control was absolutely freaking insane because these are predominantly a fun sounding headphone for electronic music. That amp, the HM1, is one of the best solid states I've heard for electronic music, fast paced music. The way it grabs those drivers 
and manipulates it, you can tell it's the amp that's in charge, not the headphones. And it's some of the most incredible percussional instrument sounding amp pairing you will find. If you can find that amp, you only make 50 a year, it's a bit of a nightmare. For me, my favorite pairing in a solid state form has been the Hollow Audio Bliss or the Monoblock AHP2s where you've got the textural information, pitch black background and the vast grandiose stage. I don't think that vast grandiose stage can be had with the HM1. And the sound characteristics of the HM1 is leaning more towards the analytical side, which I don't really prefer unless you go to Class A. But the Class A servo performs better, so I always used to leave it at that. Uh, by the way, boosting the bass region by a couple of dB on the HM1 takes this headphone from a 9 to a 39,000. It's absolutely freaking insane. It all comes down to taste. How do you want to flavor your chicken? Spicy, lemon, salty, take your pick. But for me, it's the bliss. But ideally, you really do want to run these headphones or the TC on tubes. And not only any tube, and not any tubes either. A high performing amplifier like the KNHA 300 Mark II, NV, WA33, etc. This deserves it. This deserves it, genuinely. Shall we do some comparisons? I think for this section, the best way before we break that down would be for me to paint you a picture. I have used this analogy before, this element of analogy that I will convey again to you, but in a different way, in a different manner. You have been invited to a mansion. You are in the atrium and there are two glass spiral staircases, one on the left, one on the right. One of them says High Feynman says Varas, the other says Abyss 1266. Taking a stroll up the stairs for the High Feynman says Vara route, you come to a beautiful restaurant. It's a dark hotel lit bar. Everything is pristine, elegant, eloquent, shiny, and just in the right place. The knife and fork and spoons have been laid out as if they're spatial presentations done by a tape measure. If the cloth on the table is supposed to be white, it's pristine white. If the chair is leather, it's the best Italian leather. If the carpet is navy blue, it's the best of the navy blue. Everything is where it's supposed to be. If there is discourse and shouting, everybody will turn and look because it's visible. If you order some food or a drink, it gets delivered in the right way at the perfect time. The lighting is soft, white and beautiful. Sometimes if you look directly at it, it can be quite harsh. This depends on the source you're using. But everything from timbre to tonal balance to textural information is reference. It's how it's supposed to be. And it's only just enough. No more, no less. Not extra spice for the chicken, just enough spice. It's not too loud, just loud enough. You find the jokes funny, but you're not falling on the floor. And everybody is well behaved. That's the sound characteristics of the High Feynman Vara. So you might not like this all the time. This might be good for occasions, anniversaries, birthdays, etc. So you come back out of those doors, go down the stairs, 
back to the atrium. You take off your suit jacket, you roll up your sleeves, you take off the tie, you take off your Rolex, you put them all on the table provided for you. You're now in your just your shirt, just your trousers, you climb up the abyss, AB1266 stairs. You open a pair of grandiose doors and it's huge inside. It's bright, bright as day. There are groups congregating all over the place, but there is so much space it doesn't feel crowded. There aren't speakers in the room like there was at the bar downstairs playing gentle jazz. No, there are 808s everywhere. There are cabinet speakers all the way up to the ceiling. And the bass is so intense, so visceral. You feel it more than you hear it. If there is a joke to be had on the other side of the room, somebody's screaming with laughter, you get in every nuance of it, even the bit when their whiskey goes up their nose and their eyes are watering and they're coughing. All of it, all of it is shoved in your face. When you go to dance on the dance room floor, there's foam being thrown everywhere. There's sweat, there's heat, the music's pulsating. It's putting your heart in your throat. That's the delivery of electronic music on the AB1266. It's a rave. I think for every aspect of Sasvara that is in the right place at the right time, AB1266 goes crank it up to 10. The bass is more intense, more visceral and impactful, but in a fun, unrealistic way. And yet Tamba is superb on the AB1266. In fact, Tamba is fantastic on all Abyss headphones. They know how to tune headphones properly. Whether the tuning's for you, that's another matter. But they know how to tune headphones. Textural information, oh my God, this unit on tubes is sublime. You feel as though your mind's eye is touching the drum skin. It's, it's very visceral, very articulate in regards to the edges around instruments. It's a fun sounding headphone. And if you've got high and Sesvaras, if you've got Dan Clark Stealth, if you've got headphones of this caliber, you will require an atrium, you require an abyss, you require an abyss AB1266 in your collection. Can it be your only headphone? I think for some people it can, yes. For me, it's a partner. It's a partner to the hi fi Mensas Varas, and it will be a partner to the X9000s and the Z10e that is on the way. Because those are more reference. This is more throwing caution to the wind. In conclusion, should you buy an Abyss AB1266, whether it's the TC or the Phi? Hell yes, if you've got the money. But remember, you can't throw it on bad equipment. Bad equipment yields bad results. It will require chains that require minimum of 7K. Decent tube amp, decent DAC. Everything's visible, everything's detectable. You will be able to tell. Do not throw this on a Mojo 2. First of all, don't drive it. Second of all, no. It's a hard to drive headphone. It's a headphone that requires refinement. Please don't take your Ferrari to the shops. Take it to the track where it's designed to be driven. In regards to the TC, I will put a tiny uh, bit of comparison here because I've only had a very short amount of time with it. I had a little amount of time at CanJam London on the Lena stack, the 30,000 uh, pound Lena stack amp, DAC and clock and it was the highlight of the show for me genuinely. Uh, I loved it so much. It's sweeter in the mid-range, it's less aggressive in the treble region um, from memory. 
but I'm having to wait until that unit comes in for full review to actually do a comparison with this one side by side. For now, exclusively, this has been the Abyss AB1266 Phi. So if you do see it on the used market, I highly recommend it if you like a V-shaped sound, but done in the best way possible. Probably the best V-shaped sound I've ever heard, in fact, in a headphone. Well done, Abyss. This has been amazing. You can't buy this on the website you will only be able to get a variation of the Abyss Phi, the 1266, AB1266, on the used market. And it's still worth every penny, genuinely. There's no point giving Tiger scores to this one because this model you will never be able to find, but an Abyss AB1266 Phi you might be able to get. And that by itself, warrants a four tiger scoring. I hope you have enjoyed this review. I hope it's been at least educational, if not um, very, very useful, because obviously this one's very different. But the manipulation of the pads, the band, and everything else to do with actually getting the right sound out of it will be very useful to you for the AB1266 TC as well. They will translate together. Until next time, I'm Koji CEO. Peace. And if you like reviews such as these, all of your support is very welcome on Patreon, where your generosity goes towards paying our editor, our camera person, and equipment in for review. I appreciate every one of you. And if this is a little bit beyond you, your like, your share, your subscribe, is all I require from you. I will see you in the comment section down below. Oh, and if you love this review, or if you like this review, watch the Diana Phi and Diana V2 here. Oh, by the way, the Aperio is coming in for review, the $30,000 electrostatic system. Subscribe, you don't wanna miss that.